So where we left off last time was lo looking at bumper cars and, and part, of the, part of the fun of bumper cars is, well, is, is, is the collisions between them. And when they collide, they transfer important conserved quantities. So, so to a physicist, this is like a, it's a laboratory in which to watch the conserved quantities move around. And yes, you can look in, at energy moving from object to object. But we've done that to an extent, although you're welcome to ask me about it in the context of bumper cars. More interesting and new, at least for us, is the movement of two other conserved quantities of, of well, they're about motion. And one of them is just momentum. And the other one we'll see in a moment is, is angular momentum. It's the rotary version of, mo of momentum. And whereas, I'll just rem I'll remind you this again, that whereas energy is just an amount, it, it has no direction to it. You just, you have more energy, you have less energy, great. Momentum has direction. It's, it's going somewhere. It's, it's the conserved quantity of, of moving, or that's the way I think of it. Uh, we'll see that angular momentum is the conserved quantity of rotating. So it, too, has a direction to it. You can rotate one way or the other way and so on. So where I, where I kind of left off with respect to momentum was the idea that, you, that, that it is a conserved quantity if, you're, if you have momentum, you, 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 you have it. You can't hide it. Actually, I, should, I want to roll back one, one uh, question here. The momentum you carry with you turns out to be a, uh, well, it's, it's a new quantity. It's an interesting new quantity. You can calculate it pretty easily. This is one of these calculations that, that I'll show you. I'm not going to ever ask you to, to know it. It's simply your mass times your velocity. So for, for a certain mass of two people walking along at a steady speed side by side, if one of them has twice the mass of the other, the, the more massive person carries twice the momentum of the other. Simple as that. So this sort of fits with your sensibilities, that a, that a moving truck carries something with it in large quantity, whereas a moving Mini Cooper carries less, and finally a little bug flying by carries even less, even if they're, though they're all going with the same velocity. So that's the conserved quantity, momentum. That's what you carry with you. You don't carry force with you. And if you remember the first day I asked you about distinguishing two different uh, pair, pairs of quantities, one of them was force and momentum. Can you distinguish force from momentum? And it's worth harping on this for a, for a second. That is, momentum is what you carry. You don't need anything else around you. You can, be, you can be cruising through empty space carrying momentum with you. If you've got it, you can't get rid of it, so you keep moving. Your velocity can't change. You can't change your mass, so your, your mo and your momentum is fixed, so your velocity must be fixed. It's, just, it's this relationship down here at the bottom. Your momentum is your mass times your velocity. Velocity has a direction to it, so, so does momentum. It's in the same direction as your velocity. So if I'm moving along with the velocity to the left of one foot per second, I am carrying with me momentum associated with my mass times my velocity of one, meter per one foot per second to the left. I can't stop until I give my momentum away. Is that OK? So it's what you carry with you. What you don't carry is a force. force forces are related to momentum in that the way in which you transfer momentum involves a force. But once you're traveling, you've, you're not carrying the force anymore. You're carrying what it transferred, and that is momentum. OK? Uh, forces were involved in transferring energy, too. Remember work? Work is force times, times uh, the distance in the direction of that force. It turns out that the transfer of momentum is also a simple calculation. It's not. You don't do work on something to transfer momentum. Doing work on something transfers a different quantity, energy. To transfer momentum, you do a different thing. You do an impulse. It's, awkward, it's an awkward expression I always struggle with. You, you do an impulse. You don't, you don't impulse something, but whatever. You do an impulse on it, which is you exert a force on something for a time. Force times time. And the force has direction to it, but time doesn't. Time's just an amount. So there's no issue of which way you push. You know, do you have to push in the same direction as some movement? No, no, you don't even need movement. You just have to exert the force. So if you push on even a wall, you are actually transferring momentum. Because force 
times time. You're letting, as time goes by, you're transferring momentum. Now, the, the wall may not accumulate any, or it may get rid of it as fast as you give it to something. Uh, this, this little block, if I push gently enough on this block, nothing much happens. I am actually transferring momentum to it. But it's giving that momentum to the table by way of friction. It's exerting a force on the table back. So my momentum is, is not accumulating in this block. If I push harder, though, it accumulates. And then it finally, it, it, started, it started to move, having accumulated some momentum. And then it skidded to a stop in which, during which it gave away its momentum to the table. So let's see. You OK with the idea that momentum is a conserved quantity you carry with you and that it's got a direction, namely the direction you're heading. Any questions about momentum itself? How about the transfer of momentum, which involves pushing on something for time? You want to get, you want to, to get a person on a bicycle moving forward. They, they, they're timid in learning how to ride a bicycle, so you give them a push. The longer you push and the harder you push, the more momentum you transfer into them. Only then, the faster they'll be going, because if they've got more momentum, their velocity has to increase proportionally. Okay? About those impulses. In a bumper car, there are a bunch of different con uh, places in which the impulses occur. To get started in your bumper car, you, you hit the pedal, the, ex the accelerator pedal, uh, when the ride starts, and you begin to accumulate forward velocity. What's going on here? The, with, you've got a powered wheel. Remember those things? There's a powered wheel run by an electric motor inside your bumper car. And it's trying to, well, it's, it's being spun by the motor. Friction between that wheel and the, the, uh, the ground surface. They exert frictional force on each other. And the frictional force from the, from the ground pushes your wheel, and therefore your entire car, forward. And you gradually go faster and faster. We've thought of that so far in terms of force causes acceleration, and that your velocity changes, and so on. That much, I hope, is OK. But you can also think of it in terms of momentum. Same story, same physics, really. It's just a different way of looking at it. The, we the ground is pushing the, the bottom of that wheel that powered wheel forward and transferring momentum to the wheel and to the car. It's accumulating forward momentum, the car is. Um, the ground is getting backward momentum from the car. It's a perfect transaction. The, the ground gives it to the car. The car takes it away from the ground. The ground, in principle, is going backward a little bit, but it's so massive you'll never notice. So the car goes faster and faster, having accumulated momentum, maybe over two seconds to get you up to speed. And then you smack into somebody in a car that has the same mass as your car, and, and they do the, uh, the billiard ball trick. You, you hit their car and come to a dead stop, and their car zooms on. And that all happened in a very short period of time. It took you two seconds to get up to speed, and bang, in a 20th of a second, you lost all that speed. What happened? Well, you gave away every bit of the forward momentum you had to the other car, which now has it, and off it goes. Um, that transfer of momentum, because it occurred in such a short period of time, involved a bigger force than your original starting process. During the starting process, over a two-second period, you accumulate enough momentum to be going at a certain speed. And that meant the, the ground pushed you forward gently. I can, I can illustrate this a little bit with my, my little toy air hockey table here. There's you. And this is a, now this is trying to be frictionless so I can get things going. For two seconds, you gradually picked up speed, and off you go, right? But if you smack into this other person, let me get you going, smack. If I, if I hit you squarely, if you hit this guy or squarely, you come to a dead stop in a very short period of time. So what I'm trying to convey to you is the idea that you can transfer momentum slowly, small force for a long time, 
or you can transfer momentum quickly. Huge force for a short time. It's the product of the two that matters, force times time. That's the impulse, the amount of momentum that's transferred. So where does this matter? Well, I'll illustrate it with, well, let, me, let me first, I'll show you, uh, fun and games, but I'll describe for you a, a situation that's a sa sadly familiar to some. You're driving along down a road, having accumulated forward momentum in yourself along with your car. How did that happen? The, car, the car's powered wheel was interacting with the ground, the ground pushed forward, the car gradually went faster and faster, accumulating forward momentum. You're, you're cruising along. You personally were also given momentum, not necessarily by the ground so much as by the back of your chair, your, your car seat was pushing you forward for a long period of time. You gradually accumulated more and more and more and more for momentum. And then the, the rabbit ran across the road. You veered a little bit, and you hit a tree. Fortunately, you were going slow enough. Not, you know, no injuries occurred, OK? But you stopped very fast. Worse still, you ha your, your car stopped very fast, transferred all of its forward momentum to the tree. You have to also stop by way of by transferring your forward momentum to parts of the car. What are you going to do that to? Well, you could do it to the steering wheel. You could transfer all your forward momentum to the steering wheel, which, which is kind of hard. And you would transfer, it, it's physically hard. You would transfer all your forward momentum to that by way of a big force in a very short period of time. But instead, an airbag popped up in front of you, and you hit the airbag. What the airbag's purpose in life is, is to prolong your transfer of momentum, more time. You're going to give all your momentum to the car, ultimately then to the tree. But you don't want to do it quickly. Because if you do it quickly, the force has to be big. Force times time. So do it slowly, the force can be small. So the airbag puffs up. You transfer the momentum much more slowly to the airbag, and you come to a stop gradually by way of a small force for a long time. You questions about that, that idea? It's, it's the same. This, this shows up everywhere. You walk along in the middle of the night. You're, you're going to go trying to, you know that there's ice cream in the freezer, but you can't see it. You're walking along, and you walk into something. Bang! Two choices. You walked into a cinder block wall, bad idea, because then you're going to transfer all your forward momentum to the cinder block in a thousandth of a second by way of a huge force. Fortunately, instead, you walked into your friend's Nerf refrigerator, boing, and you transferred all your forward momentum again, but with a, over a long period of time, because it yields the, the soft surface. It yields. It prolongs the transfer of, of uh, momentum. Long time, small force. Is this making sense? All right. My public service announcement version of this, which is this stuff. League baseballs. You know, this one claims to be an official league baseball. They are really hard. You, just, you don't think of them as a hammer. But I could have you guys do it, but I'll do it myself. Here's a nail. Here's, the, here's this. I, you can pound a nail in with a baseball. Of course, you know, you, you have to put a handle on it, but we did that. That's easy enough. But it, even without the handle, if you th somebody who can throw a, a serious fastball at that nail can pound the nail in with a pitch. Why is that? Once you get the ball moving, however you do it, whether you do it with a handle or whether you do it by just simply throwing the ball, you've, you've invested momentum in it, forward momentum. And when it hits some obstacle, just the wall or, or the nail in the wall, the, the ball is going to transfer all of its forward momentum to that nail, approximately. I mean, approx if it transfers all of its momentum, it comes to a dead stop. If it transfers a little less than all of its momentum, it continues forward a little bit. If it transfers more momentum than it had, 
which is itself an interesting observation. It is possible to actually run a deficit of forward momentum. I'll show you my, uh, uh, this is a little aside, but that's life. I'm going to transfer more momentum to that wall than I had. I'm going to therefore run a deficit of forward momentum. Watch what happens. I just happen to be walking along, forward momentum, lots of it, lots of it. I transfer all of it. Boing, I transferred so much, I actually end up going backwards. I have a deficit of forward momentum. I, I, I gave it one and a half times what I had, and I go backwards as a result. That's what happens during bounces. A bounce involves giving all your momentum to something and even more. So you end up going backwards, having less than no forward momentum is backward momentum. Is that okay? My side. All right. Well, so, so back to the baseball. You throw the baseball at the wall or at the nail, it's going to transfer all of its forward momentum, approximately. And because it's so hard, it transfers all the momentum in a thousandth of a second or something, maybe, maybe not even that long. That's very fast transfer of momentum. And if it had a lot of momentum, it needs to transfer the impulse involved. It's a big impulse, that is a lot of transferred momentum. And it takes place in a short period of time. What, what do you need then? A huge force. A force so great that it's able to push the nail into the wood or the wall. What's the alternative? Use a softer ball, one that has a little more cushion to its surface. And that spreads out the, the uh, momentum transfer in time. Longer impulse. Longer impulse, that is when the time involves longer, the force can be sh smaller. So this actually, this, this is, this is not a league ball anymore. This is a soft strike. It's one of these various, there are a variety of, of softer than official league ball balls. And you can't pound a nail in with this guy. It has the same mass, carries the same momentum when you throw it at 100 miles an hour, but it transfers its momentum more, more slowly. And the result then is that it, the, the forces involved during the, the impact, what, what are actually called, not surprisingly, impact forces. The impact force, which is the force involved in conveying momentum during a collision. The impact forces are smaller. So, so the public service announcement part of the story is little kids who are dreaming of playing in the major leagues and their parents in particular, dreaming that way, may want them to play with the official league balls because cause it's, you know, because they're official. But basically, they're then throwing around or batting around hammers, flying hammers. They might as well be made of steel. They transfer momentum so fast that they're really dangerous. I certainly, I, you know, I've got a, a family friend who got hit in the eye by his brother, his brother the pitcher, got him square in the eye with a league ball, and he's fine and his vision's fine, but he, but he, he looked amazingly bad for a couple of weeks. Like, I have pictures somewhere, but they're like, oh, wow, uh, you do not want to get hit by a properly pitched league ball. But you can get killed by them, right? So, if Someday in the future when your kid wants to play uh, baseball and stuff like that, either, either get them the proper protection against those balls or soften the ball up a little bit. Is it, is it okay? Um, I used to, used to do a lot of television for, for hockey. It's the same idea. The hockey puck, there is a reason why hockey players and dentists have a lot of interactions. It's because same. So it's basically another flying hammer, just disc shaped. Be careful with hockey pucks. All right? It's a general rule of thumb. We go through life trying you know, to transfer momentum slowly. You know, every, all your interactions with stuff, when you run into things, bump into them, uh, push on them, you want to, you often end up transferring momentum. Don't do it fast. It hurts. You, you know, you just walked along and you, and you accidentally smack your hand into a table. Surely you've done this sort of thing, or to catch a door, or whatever. It's the hard stuff that doesn't move out of your way. Sudden transfers of momentum. 
the impulse is, is significant. If the time is short, the force is large and the force hurts. All right, that's my whole harangue about momentum. Do we have anything else, else to show you about momentum? No, we're good. So bumper cars, the reason they've got rubber bumpers is to spread out the momentum transfer. If they use steel bumpers on those bumper cars, the transfers of momentum would be too fast and you'd get hurt. So they spread them out longer time. All right, now I really have done this. Oh, I just did this thing. The, the, uh, the bumper, the, uh, the, the mallets of different hardnesses. All right. Why is it so slow? All right. Well, having told you that bumper cars do not carry a force, we can look at another possible question. Is, do they carry a torque? Once again, the answer is no. You don't carry torques. It's not a conserved quantity. You can, no force, no force, no force, force, no force, no no force. It's not conserved. It's just, a, it's just a physical quantity. It's interesting, but it's not a. It's not one that can be can't be created or destroyed. I can create a force. Momentum, I can't. Angular momentum, I can't create either. So you don't carry torque with you. You carry a conserved quantity known as angular momentum. It's the rotational version of momentum. Once you got it, you can't get rid of it. You have to keep it. And like ordinary momentum, it's a physical quantity having to do with motion, and so it has a direction. So angular momentum, has the, it has the usual direction. Remember the axis and the right-hand rule stuff? I'm about to acquire angular momentum upward. I have none right now. To get it, I, have to, I need help. Something's got to give it to me. I'm going to get it out of the ground by way of a torque. The, I'm going to twist the ground. The ground is going to twist me back. Newton's third law of rotation. And ready, get set, boom, OK, I got angular momentum. And I can't stop spinning until I give away my angular momentum, which I'm about to do by way of another torque with the ground. Ready, I gave it away. So I carried it with me. Now, it's not very convincing when I'm here walking around doing it. So the equivalent of my wheelie cart, one of these days I'll get a wheelie cart that goes straight properly. But, but here I am now on a rotational wheelie cart. Once I've got my feet up on this ro rotating platform, I'm pretty free to rotate. Not perfect, but pretty close. And I, I, st I, actually I, sh I shouldn't be spinning at all. I'm getting on not spinning, and I shouldn't be able to start spinning. It's, I'm, it's got a little bit of out of balance here. But I, I start with no angular momentum, and I can't acquire any without being given it by something else. So where I'm going to get it from? Wow, we're really going all over the place here. Uh, I'm going to get it from the ground. I'm going to get the ground to give me a, a twist. Ready? Gets that twist. And now I've got angular momentum. And until I get rid of it, I can't stop. Got to go, got to go. Gotta. My angular momentum right now is, is again, the right-hand rule. It's upward. And that's as opposed to I'm going to transfer momentum to the ground. Angular momentum. Whoa. Now, I'm gonna, now I've got angular momentum. Ooh, downward. Right, and I not give it away. So it's another conserved quantity, and it can be transferred from one object to the next. It's it's got some complexity too, because angular momentum you have to you have to have in mind the point about which the rotation is occurring, and and the natural using the natural pivot of the system is is the obvious choice for looking at at angular momentum. During impacts, it's kind of a bit complicated. But the main thing to, to recognize is that, that spinning objects carry with them a conserved quantity associated with that spin, namely angular momentum. And they can only stop spinning by, by exchanging angular momentum with things around them. So a spinning bumper car colliding with another bumper car can, get, can convey the spin from one to the other. Um, again, it's, it's a little complicated because there are multiple objects with their own centers about which to pivot. So it makes it messy. But what I, what I will show you, though, is a transfer of momentum, angular momentum, between two objects. It's not exactly bumper cars, but it's fun. And this is one. I can show you these things, but until you do it yourself, you can't appreciate the effect. I'm going to spin this wheel up like crazy with a, there's a grinder with a, a friction wheel on it. So I'm going to get this, this 
bicycle wheel going like crazy. It actually has a large rotational mass because hidden inside the tire is metal wire. It's, so it's got a lot of mass. This thing is, it's not just a normal bicycle wheel. So we'll get it really chock full of angular momentum invested in it by way, I should say, of an angular impulse. Just to show you angular impulse, it's the next slide. Dunk. Not surprisingly, an angular impulse is a torque times the time over which the torque is exerted. So you can, you can invest angular momentum slowly by way of a small torque over a long time, or fast by way of a big torque over a short time. But anyway, you, you get angular momentum. So I'm going to invest angular momentum, and this, t this gets a little noisy initially. Let me just let me get this guy going. So it's, this is a long angular impulse. More and more angular momentum invested in this wheel. Woo! And I do encourage you to try this after class. Just make sure your arms are long enough that you don't get tread marks on your front. It is possible. Okay, so now it's got no angle. The angular momentum is entirely horizontal away from you right now. My angular momentum is zero. So right now we have no vertical angular momentum. And the swivel chair is only able to keep, uh, prevent me from ex exchanging uh, vertical, the vertical part of angular momentum is, is, is going to be fixed when I take my foot off the ground. So we have got no, we have no vertical angular momentum right now. Is that okay? Watch what happens if I rotate the wheel. I didn't touch the ground. The wheel is now rotating this way. It's got upward angular momentum all of a sudden. And my angular momentum is downward. The wheel and I together still have no vertical angular momentum. You know, it's like power steering. I'm exchanging angular momentum with the wheel. Whenever the wheel gets, has downward angular momentum, I have to have upward. Whenever the wheel has upward angular momentum, I have to have downward. Because together we have none. No, no vertical portion of angular momentum. You, you able to follow that idea? And what you can't appreciate is I'm twisting really hard on the wheel. It, there's a real torque involved in flipping over. It's not effortless. It's like, ah! Is that OK? All right, so, 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 you know, try it. Now, here's another case where to get it to come to a stop, I have to get rid of energy because it's got kinetic energy associated with its motion. I have to get rid of angular momentum. How do I do this? All of it by way of an angular impulse with the ground. And if I do it, if I, they, they hate it if I do it on a linoleum. I'll do it on this piece of board. It's skidded to a stop and left a nice black smudge mark. Sliding friction. So the, the, the energy went away. As, th as thermal energy and friction, right? And we caused a lot of wear on the tire. We wore away some of the rubber. All right. So questions about the exchanges of angular momentum? I, I, hopefully, you can follow what I just did. Again, it's like fun and games is, is okay, but these these demonstrations should they should have a purpose and they should convey understanding. So hopefully you can see that if, if we started, the two of us having no vertical portion of angular momentum, I can't control horizontal because that swivel chair doesn't let me swivel every which way. There, there are gadgets that do that, right? The, they strap you and let you tumble every which way, but that's just like bar city for me. This is bad enough. Um, we started with no vertical angular momentum. All we could do then, the, the wheel and I, is exchange angular momentum between us. If it had, it, we, had we had zero, so it, if it ends up turning such that it's got downward angular momentum, I have to have upward angular momentum to cancel, and vice versa. Questions about that? You're just accepting it. My word is gospel truth. Well, good. It's true anyway. Um, all right. So, angular momentum. One thing, so, so with momentum, going back to momentum, remember momentum, an object's momentum, my momentum, is my mass times my velocity. Momentum itself is a conserved quantity. So if nothing is exerting a force on me, if, I'm if I, the net force on me is zero, 
then my momentum is stuck. I, whatever I got, I got. Right, because momentum is transferred by way of a force times time. No force, no momentum transfer. So an object, me, that's free of forces has fixed momentum. Well, my mass is also fixed. I can't change my mass, my shake ability, my drink ability, but that's commercial. Anyhow, my, so my shake ability is fixed, my mass. So if my momentum is stuck, because nothing's pushing on me, and my mass is fixed, my velocity has to be fixed as well. My, my velocity becomes constant. So the reason why, remember Newton's first law of motion? An object at rest, it, what? An object that's free of external forces moves at constant velocity. Where did Newton's first law come from? Really, it comes from the conservation of momentum. That if you're free of outside forces, your momentum is fixed. You can't change momentum without those forces. And since your mass is fixed and your momentum is fixed, your velocity has to be fixed as well. So that's, that's the secret underlying ingredient behind Newton's first law of motion, the conservation of momentum. Questions about that idea? It's, it's a subtle, sophisticated idea, but it's, it's the case. We can introduce it for, at the start of the semester as, as just a, a, an observation. Wow, it's true. But, but deep down, where it really comes from is conservation of momentum. You might wonder, where does conservation of momentum come from? So I'll give you a little aside on that. Momentum is conserved because the physics is the same at every location. No one's ever found a special place in which physics is different from the other places. So if the physics is the same here as it is here, as it is here, there's no special location. Space is uniform as you, as you go through from place to place. Because of that, there is a conserved quantity. And that, that gives rise to a conserved quantity. The conserved quantity is, is momentum. It's a mathematical observation actually made by, by a famous woman mathematician, Emmy Nether, who figured out that, wow, if, you, if, if space is uniform like this, a continuous uniformity, symmetry of space, you have to have a conserved quantity. In this case, it's momentum. It turns out that angular momentum is the same thing. The physics is the same this way as it is this way, as it is this way. There's no preferred orientation in space either. So there has to be another conserved quantity. That conserved quantity is angular momentum. And lastly, the physics now is the same as the physics now, is the same as the physics now. No one's ever observed a change in physics with time. They look for it, but they've never seen it, never found it. And there's another conserved quantity that goes with, with the fact that the physics is the same every t all the time, in the past, in the future, and that conserved quantity is energy. Okay, so if you never, if you don't, hopefully you, you, you caught that as it went by. If it makes no sense, don't worry about it. It's just that you know, physicists are always looking for the whys and the symmetries of space, the uniformities of space, to, to translations, to rotations, and to movements through time give rise to these three, these three famous conserved quantities. Energy, momentum, angular momentum. All right. And the conservation of momentum gives rise to Newton's first law, namely that, that an object is free of external forces, moves at constant velocity. Uh, it also gives rise, uh, angular momentum gives rise to, to Newton's first law of rotation. Remember Newton's first law of rotation? It's got some extra words in it. It has an object that is rigid and that is not wobbling rotates at constant angular velocity. That comes about because of conservation of angular momentum. If it's rigid and not wobbling, its rotational mass can't change. And so if it's rotational mass, that's, I'll go back to this. If it's rotational mass is fixed and it's free of all external torques and therefore can't change its angular momentum. So angular momentum is stuck and rotational mass is stuck that angular velocity also has to be stuck. So if you give a big ball a spin and let go and just walk away so it's free of torques, it's got to turn at constant angular velocity because it can't change its angular momentum, can't change its rotational mass. <coughs> All right, but what if we, you know, 
What if we pay attention to those special words in Newton's first law of rotational motion and muck with them? Remember, rigid. What if it's not rigid? An object that is not rigid can change its rotational mass. Remember we saw that rotational mass actually derives from normal mass and where that mass is located. So an object that has its mass far from the pivot, if I'm the pivot and my arms, my arms are my arms are out there like this with these big chunks of mass in them, this, I now have a big rotational mass like this. If I try to rotate this way, oh, it's hard. Okay. If I pull the masses in close, oh, it's easy. I changed my rotational mass without changing my overall mass. I didn't, I didn't get rid of the, the dumbbells. It's just moving them farther from the pivot makes them more, more effective at creating a rotational mass. So you can change rotational mass is the bottom line. So that gives rise to the skater trick. And I did it last time, but I'll do it again. So I'm going to start with a big rotational mass. I'm going to obtain some angular momentum from the ground by way of torque. And I will now have angular momentum. There, I got it. Angular momentum is in me. If I now shrink my rotational mass, my angular velocity has to go up. If I increase my rotational mass, my angular velocity has to go down. Now, why is that? Uh, it's, do I have this elsewhere in here? Go back to this. It's worth making sure you understand what, what I just did. I was on that swivel chair and was free of external torques. So my angular momentum during that portion of the demonstration when I wasn't touching the ground was constant for all practical purposes, you know, short of a little bit of friction. So this was constant. Angular momentum was constant. It's conserved quantity. This product of two quantities, the rotational mass and my rotational mass and my angular velocity, the product of those two, since it is equal to angular momentum, has to be constant. But it doesn't mean that those can't change individually. I reduced my rotational mass by pulling my arms in. But the product of the two has to be, remain unchanged. So if I shrink my rotational mass I make, and make this, this part smaller, this part has to get bigger to compensate. So I started spinning faster. Questions about that idea? We've gotten out of the habit of questions. But this is what the skaters do when they, when they, they get spinning while well, they're all spread out. Big rotational mass. So they acquire the angular momentum they, want, they need for the rest of this little stunt. They go up on a tippy toe or something like that so that they have a pivot that, and are basically free of external torques. And then they pull in. And as they, as they pull in, their angular momentum, which is fixed, uh, is the product of their rotational mass times their angular velocity. As their rotational mass shrinks while they pull in, their angular velocity increases to compensate. And they spin like crazy. Any questions? All right. Let me see if I've got anything else to say about the bumper car stuff. Ah. Yeah, I, 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 I'll go back to this question. Remember th this one, if you're, if you're on a playground merry-go-round, and it's, it, it's spinning with you on the outside rim of, the, of that merry-go-round. As you climb toward the center, what happens to its rate of rotation? You all got this. It goes faster. Because as you climb to the center, you shrink the rotational mass of that whole object. And it, its angular velocity has to increase to compensate. So it goes a lot faster. Okay. I did have one other thing to say with respect to bumper cars. Because it brings up an important principle that, that we'll use throughout the semester, bits and pieces. How does a bumper car move on an uneven floor? Now, you could do the uneven floor in terms of lots of little ramps and paying all attention to all the details of the, of the, the, the slopes and there's ramp forces and stuff. <sighs> but you also could look at how the, to the total potential energy of the bumper car is changing 
as it goes up and down the valleys and hills. And it turns out that forces and potential energies are best buddies. They're, they're very closely related because potential energies are energy stored in forces. They go together. If you stretch a spring, which involves forces, you're storing energy in the spring, which is potential energy. So it turns out that just as objects accelerate in the direction of the net force on them, which is the, the force-centric way of looking at, at acceleration, accelerate in the direction of the forces. It turns out that objects also accelerate in the direction that reduces their total potential energy as quickly as possible. They basically, they want to get rid of their total potential energy as fast as they can. Pick a path, whichever one gets rid of that total potential energy quickly, that's the one it'll accelerate in. And these are not independent observations. They're the same observation looked at differently. Same physics. The direction of the net force on an object is, it, is its direction of acceleration. The direction of fastest elimination of total potential energy is, is its direction of acceleration. Those are the same. The net force is the direction that it reduces total potential energy as quickly as possible. And just a little uh, uh, um, example of this, or illustration of this, is this, this pendulum again. When the pendulum is, the, is directly bo below the pivot, it is as low altitude as it can get. If I move it away from that point, it's going to go, the ball will get higher in, in altitude, and it will have gravitational potential energy then that it does not have now. It will have accumulated some. And gravitational potential energy is, is about the only potential energy that's in this story. I don't have magnets around for magnetic energy, electric stuff for electric energy. It's pretty much gravitational. That's all we got to deal with, the only important force around. So if I take this ball away from center, it's now got some potential energy it didn't have before. It, it, it's all gravitational. It, and it's got more gravitational potential energy than it had. It, if I let go of it, it will accelerate in the direction that gets rid of its total potential energy as fast as possible. Namely, right back towards center. That is the direction. If it's just a geometry problem. If it's toward you, it, it going more toward you is not going to get rid of potential energy. It's going to go higher. That's a, bit, that's a disaster for it. Going to your left or right, not, not good either. What's its best option? Away from you, back towards where it was low. So it accelerates in the direction that gets rid of that potential energy as fast as possible. Always. Ob objects always do this. It's a universal observation. And you might think, well, okay, why do we need another observation about where, which direction things accelerate? We already have one. You just find what the net force is, and it'll go in the, it'll accelerate in the direction of the net force. The issue is that, that sometimes it's really hard to figure out what all the forces are. And you know, uh, I can't figure it out. You can go to the other version. Look for the direct, look for total potential energy and figure out where can the object move or even rotate in order to get rid of total potential energy. That's the direction it'll accelerate, or ro or anger, sorry. It lo things love to get rid of total potential energy. So we'll use that, for example, in, in situations where we've got lots of electric charges around, and we've got one more. We want to see what, what does this one do with all those other electric charges pushing and pulling on it. Ah, too many forces. We'll never figure out. Oh, we can simplify. We just look for, for total potential energy, and it's going to go whichever way it gets rid of that. All right? I've harangued about that long enough. All right. So that's the story. Bumper cars, just go back and look at bumper cars themselves. It's a lot about mo exchanges of momentum. And when you have different cars, like a, a car full of big people, a car full of one little kid, those exchanges of momentum involve impulses. They can, might be short in time, long in time. The forces go with them. Um, yeah, good enough. What I want to go get started on, just to, just to get started, is to jump off into a new territory. At this point, we, we leave behind the, the start of, the, of the, the book, the first two chapters, and go to the tenth chapter, the world electricity. And so that's, that's how this, this semester differs from uh, the fall semester. And the first topic to go after and just to, to, to play with for a second here, static electricity. So something you've encountered your whole life. Um, people have known about static electricity 
for several hundred years. Uh, just as a anecdote, of, you know, Ben Franklin, the, the, the founders of this country, many of them had enormous strengths in certain areas of, of, of scholarship or, or, or philosophy. Or ben Franklin was a serious scientist, and so a significant, he made significant contributions to our understanding of electricity during his era. And uh, who knew? He really was. I mean, the, the bit about playing with the kite and so on, you know, that's the little anecdote, but, but he was a serious study, uh, a scholar of, 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 of the world of electricity. Okay, so my introductory question, I'll, I'll do this and I'll play with some, some I'll, I'll, so a girl rubs her feet on the carpet and gives her twin a shock. And I hope you, you know, I hope you've all tortured each other with this sort of activity. Different, different locations, you get better uh, static electricity than others, but certainly I grew up giving people shocks um, by, by, by that experience rubbing your feet. So suppose, hopefully you, you, you've seen this, suppose the girl rubs her feet on the, on the carpet, instead of going and, and giving a shock to her twin, her twin also rubs her feet on the carpet. So they basically have done exactly the same thing, the two of them, and they reach out to touch each other. The question is, now, now that both of them have done it, is the, is the spark bigger, smaller, or the same? You okay with the question? Question for the question? How many think the spark is bigger? How many think the spark is smaller? How many think that it's the same? The majority are going for bigger. And since it's given the hour, I'm going to tell you that it's actually smaller. Probably zero. And the explanation is pretty simple. When you, when you do the, the, the when, sh when she does this trick of walking on the carpet and, and uh, rubbing her feet and so on, well, she, she's accumulating electric charge. And electric charge comes in two types, positive and negative, which I'll try to show you in a second. So she accumulates, let's say, positive charge because of characteristics of her shoes and the carpet. It does depend on what she's wearing and what the carpet's made of. So if she accumulates positive charge, and she reaches out to her twin who hasn't done anything. She's got positive charge, her twin has nothing. Like charges repel. And the positive charges she's got all over her hate being so near each other. They jump through the air onto her twin to spread out. So that's, opposite, that's like charges repelling. And the spark comes from positive charges leaping across and spreading out on the second kid. If the second kid, however, rubs her feet as well, she's covered with positive charges. And both kids have positive charge on them. So having the ch positive charges on one kid spread out on the other kid, no, you can't do that. They're already there. It doesn't do any good for kid A's positive charges to go on to kid B. They're just going to end up there being repelled by kid B's positive charges. So there's no spark at all. Is that okay? So just to, to finish up here with the two types of positive charge, because I can show you that. Let me start. I am going to get some charge here. And I will put it on that ball. And I'll get some more, and I'll put it on the ball. And what I want you to see now is the ball and, and this stick have the same charge on them. The ball doesn't want to have anything to do with my stick anymore. Can you see that? They hate each other. They're covered with electric charge of some sort, and they don't like to be near each other. All right, well, that's one stick. Now let me do this one. I'll do it again. Same story here, or so it seems. Now I'm in the same boat as before. I have a stick and a ball, and they don't like each other anymore. They hate being near each other. Ah, get away, get away, get away. So the question is, is whatever's on that ball the same as what's on that ball? How would we find out? Well, let's see where the two balls hate each other. first sight. Did you see that they pulled together? I'll do it again next time, but they did. 
there are two different types of electric charge. I had negative charge on one side, positive on the other, and the two together attract each other. So we'll do that again properly on Friday. <laughs>